Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. Wish Kristen happy birthday because it is her birthday yeah, today. Yeah, this is my birthday episode. I mean, it's not my birthday right now, but when As you're listening to it, yeah. happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to you. And in celebration of that, you should sign up for the short course. <laughs> yeah, if you want to give me a birthday gift uh, and, you know, give yourself a gift too. <laughs> um, so just to remind you, today is the last day of the Passion Profile short course promotion. So $50 off the course with code HOLIDAY. This is... An excellent place to start if you're new to Clarity on Fire, or maybe you've been listening for a while, but you've never, you know, done anything else. You've been kind of, you know, sniffing around the perimeter, which sounds gross, <laughs> but it was the first thing that came to my mind. <laughs> yeah, you haven't taken any courses with us. You haven't coached with us. You're just like, what is this whole Clarity on Fire and thing? Like, you like the podcast, but... If you're one of my old clients who emails me inevitably and it's like, <laughs> should I do this? No. No, you don't need to do No, that. you don't need to do that. You have access to all of this content pretty much through having worked with me. And if you've forgotten how to get it, please email me. <laughs> but like that happens every time I have know. at least one person. We have and some like, diehard people who are just like, I want to do all the things. I'm <laughs> like, that's so, so nice, but you don't need to. This is a really good first step for people who are feeling lost or confused or stuck and need something to help jolt them out of their circumstances, help get you some quick clarity, some quick career direction, narrow down your options in a good way, and like start to refine your plan, especially as we're going into 2020, this is a really great thing for you to do. Not if you've been around for ages and you've worked with me one-on-one. You don't need to do that. <laughs> so again, if you sign up by the end of the day today, December 17th, you will get $50 off the short course. You will also get access to a special webinar that we're doing. Oh my God, just... you said webinar. <sighs> How old? Oh, well, I guess we know. <laughs> it's your birthday. You've, you've increased a... in age yet again. And, here and your go. vocabulary is just reflecting that right back to us. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna ask, how old I mean, are you? Well, I know because it's your it birthday. Technically, is a webinar. <laughs> I don't like the word webinar, and I don't feel like it's wrong for me to dislike that. It's a workshop. <laughs> yeah, it's a virtual workshop. Oh God! You get to come to that in January, uh, where you get to ask us all the questions that you've wanted to ask us, and we're you... gonna talk about making goals, setting goals that actually you, that you can stick to. And that are based in something deeper than just, you know, I want to lose 20 pounds or I want to find a new job. Well, that's nice. Those aren't going to stick. Nothing you do that comes from that shallow of a place is going to be effective. So, no. And again, if you sign up by the end of the day today, you get grandfathered into our 2019 coaching rates. Grandmothered if you did, into. Or grandmothered in. Grandpersoned into. <laughs> A grand person. <laughs> well, I feel like that that can encompass it, like encompass some great aunts who didn't have kids and like sure but they were like really active in a person's life. You know, yeah, I was close with my great uncle. Right, a great grand person to you. Yeah, okay, right. I like that. So you get grand person, great grand person. No, not great, great, just grand person into our 2019 <laughs> coaching rates already. Yes, because they're going to be increasing in 2020. So if you want to work with us post short course, then you get to save some money if you sign up today. Mm -hmm. And if you are serious about talking to us about coaching after having done the short course, which, you know, inevitably a couple people intend to be because they don't intend the course to be their last step. Sometimes it's just the first step. Then you have the chance to talk to us about coaching before we open enrollment again in March. So you can get like, you know, a couple months 
head start if that sounds like, hey, maybe I'd rather get my shit together in January of 2020 rather than wait until the first quarter of the year is already mm-hmm. behind us. So all of that is to say, go to the, the episode description, show notes, whatever you want to call it. Link to the short course page is there where you can read more about it. Get clear on whether or not this is something you want to do. Use code HOLIDAY for 50 bucks off. That works on the one or two payment option, by the way. And, you know, we'll see some of you in that (laughs) anti-resolution webinar. Webinar. (laughs) Well, and if you are listening to this after December 17th, because I don't always listen to every podcast the day it comes out, then... You're shit out of luck. Nope. Oh, the nope. short course is available 24-7. <laughs> you just don't get all the extra fancy bonuses, but you can still, still there. sign up for the course and you can still figure out, get some career direction going into this new year, this new decade. Ugh. Well, speaking of, that's what this episode is about. Mm-hmm. Decided because it's, you know, your birthday. It's the last day of a promotion. It's the second to last episode that we're going to do this year. End of... A decade, which is terrifying to me because I very clearly remember 2010, New Year's. Mm -hmm. Um, I figured we should have a decade in review. Ooh, a Mm -hmm. decade in review. And we're going to try to keep this. Not every little thing. Yeah, not too long because a decade could take a long time to review. No, go through it like chronologically year by year. Like, here's what was great about this year. Oh, no, that could take forever. That's Well, first of all, that wouldn't take forever because I have a lot more of of, like, this is what was crappy about this year than I have about... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I have the alternate. Sorry. Um, but okay. So the first thing that I wanted to, to have both of us talk about, and I am very open to this taking whatever tangent it takes. I don't have like an outline planned at all for this conversation. But I want to know for each of us, who do you think you were at the beginning of this decade? And who are you now? Hmm. At the beginning of this decade, I was just about to finish up college. Mm-hmm. We were like four months from graduating college or five I months. I was very lost. I had yeah. no idea what I wanted to do. I was con- I was considering or was what I was going to do out, out of the bubble of college because I hadn't thought about it that much in college because I was just loving going to class. And you and I were going to live together and I was going to move to Richmond and... We were, we were going to work at the same company. And then you didn't tell me that you had changed your plan. And then you were like, no, I'm going to stay here and like be with my boyfriend and try to get a job in this college town. And I knew that was a stupid ass plan. Which I, didn't happen. But at the, the time, I couldn't tell you that because I didn't know how to communicate nearly as well. And so I was just annoyed at you. And I was <laughs> mad because you changed the plan without telling me. And then you didn't talk about it again, which was kind of MO for you back then. But yes, like the burying a- your head in the sand and avoiding confrontation. Well, and actually that's what I was going to talk about for where I am now what versus changed? where I am then. So first of all, I was very lost. My plan was changing all the time. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I also was not very self-expressed, not very good at communicating, especially if it was hard or there was any kind of tension or conflict. You're still, still working love on it, it still by the love way. It, but now I don't completely shut down or run away. Um, and <laughs> no. She just gets the deer in the headlights look sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that feels like a really big... Yeah. Both of those things have been huge yeah. changes where now I am so sure that what I'm doing is the right thing for me to be doing. Yeah, And I don't know if I'm going to be doing it forever, but I certainly see where it's going in the shorter term. And I have I have very little doubt about that. Like in terms of the lost feeling that no, was just consuming feel, me yeah. a decade ago, don't feel that like at all. You are definitely a big avoider, big yeah. denier, big passive aggression energy. Yeah. Oh, well, all those are tied together. All oh, those 100%. came from the same place and the yeah. same thing. Not wanting to see the truth. Got triggered in the same moments. Still don't love conflict. Probably never will. I'm still a type nine on the Enneagram, which actually was another thing I've learned about myself. That's really been very helpful. And mm-hmm. so I I that's where all that came from. The denying, the avoiding conflict, the shutting down, all of that was coming from my type nine. And so now I know it, I see it, and the tendency is still there, but I can respond differently now. And that's yeah, you're much more honest huge. than you ever were back with then. myself, even. And and other people. And other people yeah. too. 
It's not like you were being dishonest on purpose, but you were inadvertently because you didn't want to confront things. You didn't want to talk about hard things. You wanted to bury your head in the sand and not see things. And so that makes you kind of a dishonest person by default. Right. And if there's nothing that triggers me more, what is it? Like, than a dishonest person? Mm -hmm. Ooh, ooh. That, no wonder. I can't believe we're still friends, to be honest. Because some of the things, like... <laughs> I know. Just, it's just like they were perfectly matched triggers. Do you know what Who I mean? Who we were a decade ago? I'm not sure Surprise. why we were so close. I don't know. But here we are. <laughs> I don't know. I think it was maybe just our higher selves were like... It's okay. You can be friends. You'll get yeah. over the worst parts of who you are eventually. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I was definitely like the worst version of myself a decade ago. Which isn't to say I was... Well, if you go back exactly a decade, I wasn't yet unhappy because we hadn't graduated college yet. But you give it another like six months to the end of, you know, closer to the end of 2010. And I was real unhappy. I was unhappy from like the day I started working in a real job. Yes. (laughs) And I mean, I was miserable. It was just, it was like the bubble, my whole, my whole bubble just burst. So fun being in school. You just have all this freedom, but it's a complete... It's a complete racket because it, you're you're an adult, but you're not a real adult. It's and you have freedom, freedom, but you don't have real freedom. And you have all this like security because you know, like, you know, you're being taken care of in some sense. And yet you're capable of picking your time schedule. You're, you know, and you can do what you want when you want. It was the best. Like that was the version of reality I really liked. And I spent every year since then trying to get back to that reality. <laughs> and I think I pretty much achieved it. Yeah, but as close as you can get as a yeah. fully functioning adult. Yeah. But I did not respond. And I mean, not respond well to being thrown into the real world and having to do something that I thought was stupid and having to work when people told me to work and commute when people told me to commute and have conversations that were completely inane and pointless. Every part of me rebelled. And because I had not done any personal development work, I had done no healing of old wounds. I was angry. I was anxious. I was rigid. Mm-hmm. And I was depressed. And those are all things I can be to, de- to this day and <laughs> will always be to a degree. It will, it, those things will always come easily to me the way that being in denial and not mm-hmm. wanting to confront things can come easily to you. But I feel like when I was thinking about our personal journeys, I was thinking about them as they're very opposite. They're all like on the same spectrum, but on two different ends. And I feel like what happens is that Where I feel like I am now is I've let go of a lot of that rigidity. I think that when you're really rigid, it's almost like you're this hard but brittle kind of plastic or something. And so if someone bumps up against you or you hit a corner, you just huge nicks of you get taken out and it hurts. And your essence gets kind of chipped away at the more rigid that you are. You can't adapt to anything. And so you have to avoid to the best of your ability, you try to avoid things that are going to piss you off or trigger you, but you can't. And so inevitably, you know, you get you get kind of mangled if yeah. when you're a rigid person out in the world. Whereas I feel like the goal is to become someone who's more malleable, like who's like putty. Where like you have a form and a shape. Like if you put it down, it's not going to melt into a different shape. But it's not so rigid that it can't adapt and or it can't be flexible blows or right bumps Whereas and bruises if you're too if you're too flexible and malleable you're all liquid you just conform to whatever anyone else tells you or wants which is where yeah, you were that's what i'm familiar with yeah. yeah and so both of us kind of had to go from the opposite which is why i'm surprised we were ever friends actually it makes perfect sense it because because you learn from people in contrast no well, i was well i was going to say is also like your extreme flexibility and my extreme rigidity actually were a match true at that time true. because otherwise it probably I mean like let's we, we really triggered the shit out of each other I think <laughs> a lot too but I feel like if you'd been more rigid it wouldn't have worked mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I, I you know we would have just really had too much friction I don't think we've come to the exact center point because hell no I'm maybe def- never gonna get to the center point <laughs> I don't point. think so either for for either of us but we've definitely both come more into that healthier mid-range point yeah that's yeah. taken a lot of work taking this whole decade uh-huh so one of the themes that I was thinking about was also that I think that life sucks so much when you don't have a light at the end of the tunnel 
And I think for so much of like the early 2010s, I did not feel like I had a light at the end of the tunnel. Or if I did, it felt so faint and so impossible that I had no idea how I was going to get there, how I was going to make it happen. And it felt so hopeless. And depression is hopelessness, is believing that yesterday is going to be, or tomorrow is going to be the same as yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that's very much how I felt for like many, many, many years and seasons. Not necessarily every single day, but it was like a, a pattern I returned to over and over again was like, I don't know that I'm ever going to get where I want to go. And I didn't even know where that was. Not and at the beginning. No, not at the beginning. It was, I remember applying for random grad schools just because I didn't know what to do with myself and applying for all these different random jobs and then actually getting into the job and being like, this was a terrible mistake. I wish we could access our old G chats from when we were working oh, in our separate those. offices. <laughs> want to see that. <laughs> About all of the complaining that we were doing and commiserating. Ugh. That was a hard time. And I didn't know where to go to escape no, it. There was just, it was just this daily drudgery of going to a job that you hate, having no idea what you'd rather be doing and having no out because you had, you know, you had no plan. There was no vision of what could come next. And so it was like, it's just this when every we day. De- when we describe that we work with people who know that what they're currently doing is not what they want to keep doing. They don't know what they want to be doing instead. That's not out of nowhere. That is no very, very deeply tied to our personal experiences. So we know the havoc that that can wreak on a person and how hopeless it does feel. So yeah, that was the beginning of this decade. It wasn't, it wasn't great. No, and even, okay, but here's the thing. Even when we got clearer about what we wanted to do, like we discovered coaching. And we, you know, enrolled in that. It didn't all of a sudden make me feel good. And if I were, (laughs) oh, okay. So one of the other questions I wanted to ask, and we're just leading right into it, so I'm going to say it, is what's the, the lesson you had to learn that you really didn't want to have to learn? Mm. And it was kind of like the way I would say it is it was the bitter pill you had to swallow and it was good medicine, but it did not taste good going down. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you for me, it was having to learn the lesson over and over and over again to the point where I feel like this lesson beat me into more putty. Do you know what I mean? Like it Uh forced me to become less rigid because it beat me up and continues to beat me up to this day. Less, but like still this decade has been a pummeling in this lesson (laughs) is if you can't be happy now, you can't be happy at all. Yeah. Which means I have been the kind of person who, and this is why you hear me preach so much about this. It's because I was the worst um, perpetrator of this crime. (laughs) I was the kind of person who just really, really believed that when I had the thing that I thought I wanted, then I would feel good. And then I would be happy and content. And whatever else I envisioned. And every time I got to another level, I never felt better. I was still pissed off. I was still (laughs) anxious. I was still depressed. I was still fearful. I was still not always a pleasure to be around. And the lesson you have to like, like, and I honestly, it didn't, I, I probably didn't start really learning this lesson until four or five years ago. Like I spent a good half of the last decade not learning that lesson. But when I finally came to terms with it, I had to admit that all you ever have is the moment you're in right now, which sounds like a cliche, but it's not. It's just actually factually correct. It doesn't matter how much future tripping you do or how much you 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 agonize over what happened in the past. The only moment that is ever actually existent is the one you're in right now. And if you cannot find a way to be happier and more fulfilled, and more at ease, and more content with where you are right now, in any given moment, whatever now is, then you are kidding yourself if you think you will ever be happy. Because it's just a series of these now moments where you're never happy. You don't know how to be happy in. Because, Because you keep assuming that happiness is some other time other than now, but all you ever have is now. (laughs) Yep. And so you move the goalpost on yourself every single time you get somewhere. And it's not just that. 
it's not just that we we put our happiness off until future moments and we assume that like getting a, the boyfriend or the perfect job or, you know, like starting the business and making all the money, which is what you and I were so fixated on for so long. Yep. It wasn't just that I kept pushing the goal post back. It was that I didn't realize until much later on in the decade that it takes a certain kind of person to be happy and you have to become the kind of person who's capable of happiness. And I was not actually very qualified to be happy for a long time because I hadn't done any of the deeper work. I hadn't Mm -hmm. even, you know what, that's not true. I had started to do the deeper work, but there was just layers and layers and layers of it that I hadn't realized I needed to keep doing. There were so many triggers that I was still, you know, easily triggered around. And there were so many things, un, you know, unhealed wounds and emotions I'd never processed from years and years and years past. And so a lot of that was making me rigid and making it hard for me to enjoy myself on a moment to moment basis and live in the that kind of both and place where you can both be happy in the present and find things to sincerely enjoy. And of course, you can like hope for different things and you can plan for different things and you can be dissatisfied sometimes with what you don't have. But I was really, really, really bad at being happy with what I had. And I have had to work really hard. And it's a humbling experience to let go of the idea that anything outside of you is going to save you. Right. That happiness is something you're going to step into one day. Or it's a knight in shining armor that's just going to swoop you off and and like pay off all your debt and and like make you super fulfilled every day. And it's like, no, people who are fulfilled are good at being fulfilled. And you have to become a person who's good at it. Yep. Not someone who gets all the things they think they want. That's the humbling lesson, the bitterest kind of pill I had mm. to swallow. And continue <laughs> to have to take in smaller doses to this day. Mm-hmm. Uh, my perpetual lesson that I've had to learn, and I get you're right, like it started out worst of all, and it's still something I have to be attentive to, is discernment. Discernment, especially of people. My (laughs) tendency is I really want to see the best in people. And I really want to see how we're connected. And I want to see their potential. And I want them to like me. And for all of those reasons, whether it's been in relationships, whether it's been in friendships, coworkers, any number of relationships in my life, even, even people I barely know, I want to see, I want to see their best qualities and I want to ignore their worst qualities or I want to ignore the parts that don't align with me and my values. And that often means overlooking behavior that is honestly not acceptable or overlooking traits that are red flags. And I have let a lot of those people in and cup them around longer than they probably should have been. And it's taken me a long time to get better at seeing things and especially people as they are. Because I know where my normal tendencies are going to be. And I have to continually pause and check in with myself and say, what is the truth of this situation? And are these actions backing up this person's words and how do I, how is this making me feel? And all of those types of questions that I think for you have always been really easy, Rachel, pretty very natural. But for me, I have to be very cognizant and intentional about checking in like kind of constantly um, or else I'll just put on my rose colored glasses and move right along. I mean, thank God you had me. (laughs) <laughs> I don't really mm-hmm. allow for rose-colored glasses if you're in my orbit. Mm-hmm. So I'm never going to be someone who is like super skeptical and super suspicious and seeking out the worst in people. I'm striving for neutral, just neutral, like just seeing what's accurate. <laughs> what's there, not yes. what you, not what you, you know, assume is there in a negative or a positive, like just literally what's there. Yeah, yeah. That's taken this whole decade. I'm always going to have to check myself for that. I don't think I'm ever going to not have that default tendency. Um, But it's been a real journey and I've had a lot of heartache along the way. 
because I wasn't willing to see what was there and I wasn't willing to learn this lesson. I wish I could time travel back and give this to... Let me listen to this. Oh, I was going to say me, but yeah. I think I'd, l- I'd hear it better coming from me. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> I want to hear you saying this. Me 10 years ago wants to hear this so that she doesn't pull her hair out every time oh, you do this. Oh, oh you want to play decade. this recording for you a decade ago. So I want to play it for me so a decade ago. So that I'll ago. relax and chill out and stop telling you what to do. <laughs> yeah, because it was it, it is maddening, you know, to watch someone go through something and not be able to like stop it because... And honestly, like that is part of the lesson too, is people have their own journeys and you can't control what path they're on. And it's not up to you what lesson someone needs to learn. And unfortunately, people often have to go through crap multiple, multiple times before they're capable of like learning the lesson. And it doesn't matter how much you try to tell them what to do or how much you try to, you know, fix them or save them from it. They just need to go through it themselves. And I had to learn that one the hard way. I know. For sure. It's frustrating to watch. I know. I've gotten a lot better at that though. Yes, you have. Um... And if, honestly, I feel like both of the bitter lessons that you and I are talking about, if anything, they confirm the Enneagram theory. Oh, yeah. Because there are default tendencies based on our Enneagram type. I mean, truly, the things that you and I struggle with are exactly what a nine and a four would be struggling with. So this is an endorsement for the Enneagram. (laughs) Because what a four wants more than anything is to be special and different. So I feel like I shouldn't have to go through hard things because I'm unique. Mm-hmm. And so why the hell am I struggling? And why the hell is everyone else getting something that I don't have? And aren't fours and more prone to uh, sadness or depression? For sure. So that makes it harder to be yeah. happier in the moment. Yeah. And and wanting to be saved. Yeah. You know, wanting yeah. something to rescue them from their negative feelings. And often not wanting to have to do the hard work to get themselves out. You know, like just wanting something or someone to swoop in and like just make it easy and make it all better for them. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I fell into every, every you know, pothole you can imagine a four would fall into. <laughs> and I, I mean, still am. Ditto on nine. Literally every, every challenge that nines face, that has been my whole experience. Like, if you, if you just go read a quick overview of what a nine is, you understand me on like the deepest level mm-hmm. and what my persistent challenges have been. So it's why we have a whole two-part episode about the Enneagram, because... It's very accurate, and we are proof perfect of that. I find that I'm just thinking, like, if I were to tell someone how to find the light at the end of the tunnel, because that's what I would want. Like, If someone, if I'm doing a decade in review episode, I don't want it to just be like this self-indulgent, which is something fours are very good at, by the way, <laughs> um, experience where it's just us talking about our, you know. I mean, I always hope that when you hear us talk, it's I think it's valid applicable to, hear to you too. Challenges, no matter what. But, but yes. I do feel like it's valuable to talk about. Okay, well, what if someone's closer to where we were ten years ago, mm-hmm. and then what? You know, how do they find the light at the end of the tunnel? How do they distill what we've learned and take it to heart, and maybe save themselves a couple years worth of strife? Because I do think that's possible. I do think that you are on the journey you're on and you're often going to have to encounter the lessons that you encounter, but they don't always have to be as long or as hard as you might make them out to be. Like you can make things a little bit smoother on yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing that was the most helpful for me was having someone else who was having a similar experience. That's true. Like the fact that you and I were feeling a lot of the same things made me feel a little, a little bit less crazy. Because when I would look around, it seemed like everyone else was fine at my job or our friends. A lot of people are fine. Yeah. They seemed like they were just fine. And I felt like, what is happening here? This is so wrong. And I think I would have felt a lot more lost if I didn't have one person. So Mm -hmm. um, having someone you can confide in and someone who can just say, I don't, I'm so lost, who might be able to sympathize, that. It doesn't give you answers, but at least it makes you feel a little bit less alone along the way. And again, we've done this a million times, but I will keep validating people who don't have that person by just saying, it's normal if you feel like you're looking outside of yourself and you're like, WTF, why is no one else asking questions? Why is no one else seemingly bothered by the way things are? It's a smaller subset of people that are sensitive enough and awake enough and introspective enough to to have those levels of questions and those levels of, 
you know, existential angst. I think a lot of people are denser in a sort of, and I don't mean that in like an intelligent way. I just mean they're 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 just energetically not as sensitive. They can mm-hmm. just kind of get down, put their head down, plow through life. They're not thinking about anything that hard. And that's just not the journey you're on. If you're listening to this, I guarantee you that's not the journey you're on. And I hope not just our stories are validating that you're not alone in feeling that, but the fact that we have a business <laughs> for this particular challenge means yeah. you are definitely not alone. This is what we hear all of the time. I wish I could put all of you in one big room together and just be like, go talk about how you're feeling because everyone's going to get you here. Um, we just have a virtual space instead of a just That's giant fine. conference room or something. <laughs> Um, Another thing I would say about, well, I'm just thinking about ways to find the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Um, And another thing, to echo what I said earlier, but I'm just going to make it about you now, you the listener. Stop acting like something's going to save you. Nothing is going to come in and fix you and make your life better in the way that you think it's going to. This is a really, really, really hard lesson to have to learn. I get it. I just told you how hard it was for me and still continues to be hard for me to accept this. But getting a new job is not going to solve all your problems. Getting into a relationship is not going to solve all of your problems. Getting clear on your path is not necessarily going to solve all of your problems because I've said it a million times and I'll keep saying it. Things outside of you cannot come in and rewire your whole being that's on you. You have to be the kind of person who's qualified to get the ideal job, to be a match to the ideal partner. How many people get out of an unhealthy relationship where they've been, I don't know, codependent or clingy or needy, and then they think their next step is getting into the perfect relationship? I'm like, you can't go from zero to 60. So the work is not, let's go date a bunch of people. The work is, hmm, how do I release some of my unhealthy attachments and patterns so that I can become someone who's someone who's really healthy and secure and is capable of a great relationship and is wants to do the work, wants to date? That's the work. And I feel like that's the, the humble pie I had to eat and that I feel like in order to find the light at the end of the tunnel, you have to eat too, is stop fixating on the thing that you think is going to solve your problem and fixate instead on how can I be okay with who I am? Like, how can I make peace with who I am and become the best version of myself? Because when that is your fixation, you become better at being a work in progress and you give yourself a lot of like credit and you let yourself off the hook for not being perfect. And you become, I think, more easygoing, more compassionate to yourself and other people. You become a much better person in general to be around. And all of a sudden, you're not nearly as attached to all of the things that you once thought were super important to have right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think of what has been so helpful, what was so helpful to me for finding a light at the end of the tunnel and definitely was that inner work. I mean, I hired a coach right around the time that I was trying to figure out what am I going to do? And that in and of itself was so, I mean, just so clarifying. And actually right along along the lines of that, finding examples that what you want exists and is possible. Like even just finding, hey, there are coaches in the world. There are people who are doing this work. And yeah, we did that a lot. We really like had this list of people that we really admired and we followed them very aggressively almost. Yes. And you want to know what? I don't do that anymore. I, yeah, I have, but I needed that then. I did. I have almost no one I follow aggressively whose career I want. I'm like, no, I'm yeah, good. Yeah, I'm because good. I'm very much confident in myself now and in my abilities and what I've been able to do. But so I didn't true. have that confidence before. So I really relied on like these examples of people out there who were doing what I wanted to do. And I used them as inspiration to, to prove, well, if they can do it, so can I. Yes. And that what I want is a real thing. It exists in... in and. I have every capability of making that happen for myself. So that was really, really incredibly helpful. And at first you have to get over the doubt of, can I really have that? But if you you see enough proof that, yeah, this is a thing. People are doing what you want to be doing. You start to believe more. Speaking of belief, I mean, I will also add that um, I started out this decade very kind of agnostic. 
like mm-hmm. really wanting to believe in something, but having absolutely no clarity or certainty or any conception of like, if something bigger than me did exist. And I end this decade laughing at how, I, <laughs> how I was ever really doubtful of that, yeah. which is, which is probably the single best thing I ever did for my anxiety was believing in something other than myself. You're not the only one orchestrating not, every detail of your life? No, I'm no. not omnipotent. I don't have that kind of power and I can let go of the idea that I should have that kind of power. And you have access to this deeper guide, guidance all of the time. Not only that, but like in. the universe and me have a really very robust conversation and I get signs and weird synchronicities all the time, more than maybe anyone else I know. In mm-hmm. certain, Maybe not anyone else I know, but more than most people I know. Yeah, you do. have a very weird, like, ongoing it, dialogue yeah, with the universe. it gives you the weirdest, very specific very... type of sign. Because <laughs> it knows that you'll go down the yeah, crazy it knows rabbit I'll, hole. It knows I'll Google. It knows I'm very, very <laughs> fluent in Wikipedia. And yeah. I'll always find whatever connection it's ask, asking me to find. But I didn't get there overnight. Like, that's why Kristen and I are always, you know talking about certain books that we loved, like Outrageous Openness. Great, 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 great thing that helped cure so much of my anxiety because it gave me this really tangible way to start having a relationship with something bigger than myself. And I feel like that's the problem I encounter with a lot of my clients is that they intellectually believe that they're not the arbiters of their universe or the universe at large, but they don't act like it. Yeah. And so that's more where I was, I think, a decade ago. I never stopped. I never really questioned that there was any kind of like bigger force at play, but I didn't really get it. And I certainly didn't know. You didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. How it applied to me or how it could impact my life. I did. Yeah, I didn't. I just, I just kind of felt like it was up to me for the most part. And, and that I have, that's changed on its head, just 180. Yeah. So also E Squared was a great intro book for me when I was in that. And here's the thing. It's not like reading these books cured me instantaneously, but they planted seeds that I could no longer ignore and that I could always return to when I kind of spiraled into a ditch, which I've done many, 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 many times. Well, that's why this is a decade in review, because these things did not happen in a week or two or even a year or two. But they happened some... over the span of time. And now you can look back and see, I don't even recognize that old belief system that I subscribed to. There have been some big things like, you know, like reading Outrageous Openness, E Squared, discovering Abraham Hicks videos, which I'm not going to get into. But like, <laughs> for those of you who are down the Abraham train, you know what I'm talking about. Um, that like really gave me a lot of ability to discern for myself what my relationship with the universe was. Like it gave me sort of a language and some experiments to do to prove because I needed proof. Mm -hmm. We're humans. We need proof. Yeah, I needed proof that to me felt inarguable and it it does. And I just, it's, it's not like I never have doubtful, no, I never doubt that something like exists beyond myself at this point. But I, I still, I certainly still have doubts that like I'm capable of getting what I want. I'm not like, cured of all anxiety and all depression and all fear. But to compare it to how bad it was, I mean, I was having like near panic attacks in the shower about this stuff. Like, I have not had an experience like that in years and years now. And it didn't happen overnight. It was like a gradual kind of coming, coming on, so to speak. But that to me was maybe the biggest light at the end of the tunnel was feeling like, well, there's something beyond this tunnel. You know what I mean? <laughs> this stupid yeah. ass tunnel I signed up for. Why did I do this? <laughs> Being human is so dumb. <laughs> I feel like that a lot. Hmm. Should we do any uh, just general highs and lows of the decade before we wrap I up? I don't know. I mean, how about every time I lay on the floor with with my hood over my head and it, oh, the hood of despair. Up. The hood of despair. There were many moments of the hood of despair, especially so early on despair. in business. That was rough. You don't get into business because, I mean, again, you shouldn't get into business because you believe it's a get rich quick scheme. And I didn't totally believe that, but I didn't not believe that <laughs> either. <laughs> I kind of thought maybe I would be the exception to the rule. Oh, I remember in IPEC someone telling us, 
Well, it takes about two years or two more. Two or three at least to, to get, get some a- somewhat of a stable business. And I remember side-eyeing you and being like, Psh, we're smarter we're than We're smart. That. We can do it way faster than that. Sure enough, <laughs> two to three years in, we're like, oh, this is what a business is supposed to be. But man, it was rough those early days. Yeah. Uh, quit my job way too soon. Don't that get into contribute. anything because you think it's a sure thing. Nothing. No. You know, it's no. got to be because you want to do it, not because you feel like it's going to deliver you all of your happiness. Again, nothing delivers you all of your happiness. Yep. There is no such thing as the fountain of all fulfillment. But I I do think actually going through coach training was one of the highlights. Oh, for sure. That was just an incredible experience. I, I feel so stupid and cliche using the term life-changing. No, but it but was. But it was life-changing. I mean, me before that training and me after that training were, there was a marked difference. Not just me, but like the relationships I was capable of having with people mm-hmm. really changed. So that was a highlight. And I met so many people as a result of that. Like Who everything are still I, the closest people in my life. I mean, I should probably say that except for you, I don't have any of the same friends. Yeah, that's... <laughs> You're the only friend I have. That's something I would not have predicted a decade ago. From 10 years that ago. That every one of my closest friends and closest people would look different except you. <laughs> yep, that's it. Except that for was, family, That was a little course, surprise. But yeah. Mm-hmm. And I want to just say that's normal. Yes, that's normal. For all of you who are worried, you know, I think it's great that people have friends for 50 years, but like, it's also normal if you grow apart or you grow at different rates. Or well, especially when the decade encompassed so much of our 20s, which our that, whole 20s. that is a, a really substantial growing up time frame where yeah. relationships end and new relationships form. But that happens all throughout your life. So it's okay if... In a new season of life, you have a new collection of people, a new tribe. Mm Mm-hmm. I feel like we could go... I mean, I'm trying to think of other highs and lows. I don't know. You had some health lows. I definitely had some health lows. But again, I also had some health highs. Yeah, true. And I also, you know, had some real surprise twists. There's one surprise twist. I mean, I'm not going to get into the whole story, (laughs) but finding out I had a sibling I didn't know I had was probably the biggest shock of the last decade. Maybe your biggest shock ever? Let's hope. (laughs) Let's hope that's the only one I don't know about. That's a big one. Yeah. That's a big one. But, you know, all's well that ends well on that Mm -hmm. front. Yeah, sure. And you know what? It's funny. Whenever I, like, meet someone and I tell them that story, it's everyone always has a story about that. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, oh, my God, my cousin had that experience. Or, oh, my God, like, yeah... I know someone who had that experience six times over. That is wild yeah. to me. There's that a that's lot common. of people with siblings they don't As know about. Is. Like they're like someone listening to this has a sibling they don't know about. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> or found out that they had a sibling. Some of yeah. them have it and don't know and may never know. I that, I know. I'm saying wow. there are some of you out there who really just well, you know what? That's the problem is that you're finding out. This is not how I found out, but you're finding out through ancestry.com, like, ancestry.com or, the 23 and yeah. me stuff. Like it's just making it so, you know, you can't hide anymore. You, whatever you did when you were 15, <laughs> you know, yep. or whatever. <laughs> so yeah, that was wild. Um, I didn't have any surprises quite, quite that like that. Bad. It wasn't bad. It was just shocking. shocking. Yeah, I mean, I, literally just I shock. remember how yeah. shocked you were. I was trying to tell you and you were, I was like knocking on your door <laughs> Yeah. Do you remember? And I think you I was were in the, the shower. shower. And I was like, this is such an inconvenient time for you to be showering. I have the most, <laughs> the most like bunker busting news. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm just and washing you're my just hair. Washing your hair. I'm like, and you know what? I did not wake up that morning thinking I would, I would no, have that conversation. I, didn't, I doubt it. So that is something that goes to show that you can have your whole life can turn on a dime in like good ways, weird ways, bad ways, anyway. Yep. You never um, know what a day is going to bring. You really don't know. And like, thankfully, you only have one of those like maybe once a decade, one of those types <laughs> of days in a good way and in a bad way yes. or in a neutral way because that wasn't good or bad. It was just really weird. Yeah, just a twist. It was just along a the complete path. twist in the plot. So um, <laughs> I'd like to hear everyone else's you know, I would yeah, like to I'd hear love some to of hear your highs, lows, and highs surprise and lows, twists. Surprise twists. And the bitter pill. Like, I'm really, that's probably the, the thing I'm the most patterns. interested like, in. Like, what have you felt like you've just been working through and made some progress then, but it's been a challenge over this past decade? I would be really curious to hear some of those. Yeah, like, so I hope you'll come over to, we'll link to where this episode lives on our site. 
And you can comment there and just share that with us because mm-hmm. I know people have some some wild stories. Um, and just so you know, I feel like what I feel like I had to learn, which is what I feel like Kristen and I have turned around and are, I try to do for other people is I feel like what I really wanted was I, I was like, I feel like I imagine myself in the universe and I am like a toddler holding their mom's hand and throwing the most absolutely wretched tantrum in the middle of like the grocery store because I want what I want and I want it now and I can't have it. And in order to get it, I'm going to have to do a lot more work and a lot more good behavior. And the universe is going to be very patient with me and it's going to help me get there, but it is not going to give in to my tantrums. Mm -hmm. Just like a good parent doesn't And that is what I do for my, but that's also what I do for my clients. Yes. Is yes. I try to be that version of the, it's like, listen, I'm not going to help you deny the truth. I'm not, I'm going to help you see the see reality. I'm going to force you to accept that what you think you want is not always what you want. I'm going to help you get to the point where you're capable of having the thing that you really want. And you might not like it. You might have a little bit of a tantrum. I'm going to help you. And I'll you, hold your hand through the whole thing. You, yep. I'll walk you through it. We'll breathe through it. We won't go too fast, but I can get you to the point where you're an adult, you know, like you've grown out of the toddler stuff, out of the tantrum stuff that your soul often wants to do. And I feel like, you know, whoever you use as support along your path, they should be able to do that. Good therapist, good coach, good friend, whatever. They should be the kind of person who's capable of kind of holding you to that level of accountability and not indulging the part of you that wants what they want and they want it now and they're annoyed that they can't have it and you should just give in to me and give me exactly what I want and I shouldn't have to learn my lessons. Mm -hmm. Nope, that's not why you came here. I don't know exactly why we're all here, but I can tell you right now, you're not here because you decided it was just going to be super easy and you were always going to get what you want and you were never going to be challenged and you were never going to struggle with the same thing for a decade. Nope, (laughs) that is kind of why you came here, unfortunately. Yes. Yes. Soul growth, soul evolution. Yeah, growth is hard and it's painful and it has great moments and bad moments and everything in between. And the more that you can just accept that that is the ride that you're on and that it's okay that it is a ride and that all and of the all parts of the together. ride you're are You're not normal, on it alone. So the like, easier your life <laughs> gets when you accept that that is the ride that you are on. And I think that this decade has been an act of you and me accepting the ride that we are on yeah. instead of hoping for the ideal ride that doesn't exist, which actually would be flatlining and boring. Yes. And hopefully we've done that for some other people as well. If you only have peaks in life, you just have one really high flat line. Yeah, you, know yeah, what I'm you don't actually appreciate it. No, it's not a peak. It's just a, a I'm, flat line that's really high up in the your, air. I'm thinking of Scarlett, your dog. She just has one peak most of the time. And now she just expects it. She doesn't really like know to appreciate all of the good stuff. No, she, her life is, just, well, I mean. I mean, she has a great life, but I, I Come back <laughs> as a really spoiled dog if. Seriously. You can. I'm like, you don't know how good you have it, dog. <laughs> okay. As we're wrapping up this, this episode and this decade. Yeah. Reminder that today is the last day to sign up for the Passion Profile Short Course and get all the bonuses we mentioned at the beginning of this episode. With code HOLIDAY. With code HOLIDAY. All caps, by the way. Does that matter? I think it does matter. Oh, you know, holiday, well, scream caps. it when you're... <laughs> <laughs> HOLIDAY! <laughs> Um, and so hopefully we can see some of you guys in that course yeah. before the new year. Okay, well, here's to growing and doing the work and finding people who are willing to do that work with you and getting to the point where you're capable of being happy and at ease and content, even when you're not happy or at mm-hmm. ease or content. Living in the duality of life. That's what I hope for all of you mm-hmm. and for myself and you, I guess, too. Happy and birthday, too. by the oh. way. <laughs> Happy birthday to me. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.